meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's hearing. As your name is called, please come to the front table to speak. I will announce the next speaker's name and ask that that person uh, be on deck and ready to provide his or her comments uh, as well. Written comments may be placed in the box on the table next to the speaker's table, which doesn't look like there is a box. So just leave comments on the table. Uh, please know that uh, you're not able to cede or defer your time to anyone else. Uh, each speaker will be afforded three minutes to speak on the proposed fiscal year 2018 operating budget. This public hearing is limited to the operating budget and no other topics. I ask that you observe the timer uh, to my left and also on the speaker's table, which will let you know when your time is up. Uh, the first speaker is Laurie Taylor Mitchell, followed by Nina McHugh. Doctor. Good evening. Good I'm evening. Dr. Lori. Are you ready? Okay. We are ready. Your clock okay. is running. I'm Dr. Lori Taylor Mitchell. Uh, for the last two years, I've been doing research on poverty, food insecurity, and homelessness in Baltimore County schools. And I've become involved with several groups and individuals working on these issues in schools. The most recent statistics on the BSPS website show that about 47% of all students in the school system, nearly half, qualify for free and reduced price meals. Since the federal poverty level guidelines are so low and costs of living in Baltimore County are high, the actual number of students in poverty is even higher. Almost certainly over 50% of our students live in families with incomes below what it takes to be self-sufficient. With poverty comes hunger and food insecurity. Hunger affects thousands of our students every day. Over 2,500 students were also identified as homeless last year, the highest total at Parkville High School with 101 homeless students. Homeless students are at particularly high risk of hunger on the weekends and can arrive at school on Mondays hungry and unable to concentrate. Given these tremendous problems, I urge the superintendent and board of education to create an administrative position with staff support to assess the effects of poverty and hunger and work for system-wide policies that will alleviate these problems. The school system desperately needs someone with a comprehensive understanding of these issues who can work with the Office of Food and Nutrition, with student support services, the Office of Title I, local government, community organizations, and private groups to develop programs for schools. These efforts should probably begin at the over 90 schools in the system with poverty rates of over 50 percent. Poverty affects every second of every day for these children. From my experiences with Food for Thought of Baltimore County and the Lock Raven Network, we know that some begin the school day hungry or have no money for lunch. Some do not have underwear, socks, or toothpaste or deodorant. Some families have asked for toilet paper in interviews with school staff on their needs. Poverty and its stresses also have a devastating effect on being prepared for graduation. When I uh, participated in the mock interviews for seniors at a high school last year, five of the students I interviewed had failed most of their classes in high school. They had been in and out of crisis and economic hardship the entire time. While their speaking skills were good, they could not write, they could not spell, and they had never put together a resume, and they were less than seven months away from graduation. Most had had crises since their freshman year, including one student I had met before by sheer coincidence who was doing community service work in the juvenile justice system. What will happen to them? We need programs based on the in needs of individual schools to help impoverished students from the moment they arrive in high school until they leave the system. We are very far away from that now. We need more social workers, more pupil personnel workers, and we need a commitment at the highest levels of the, of the administration to a systemic focus on poverty whose stresses directly or indirectly affect all students. In Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Nina McHugh, followed by Leslie Weber. Good evening. Hi, my name is Nina. Thank you for letting me be here in front of you today. I'm honored. Um, I am a part of the PTA Council and several boards that um, deal with food insecurity. I'm gonna tell you a story. So Parkville High School has 101 homeless students. I recently had the opportunity to work with Lori Mitchell Taylor and I was able to work with three of the social workers at, Lock, um, at Parkville High School 
and talk to them about the model that is in Lock Raven and put a pilot program into Parkville. Parkville's never been able to do this before. So on December 2nd, we had this grandiose idea. We were running against time, and if we wanted to do it, we needed to act fast. So we did. We were able to help five families in Parkville High School, two families in Parkville Elementary. This has never been done before for Parkville. In all, we were able to help 32 individuals. We had a goal of $450. From the generosity of 25 plus donors, we were able to raise more than $1,060 just for food. Not only that, we, each individual was able to get two to five items that they requested on their wish list. This has never been done. What would someone want on a wish list? They requested toilet paper, diapers, formula, things that we take for granted every day, deodorant, toothpaste, underwear, socks. It was heartbreaking. I want to say thank you to Lori, thank you to Kathy Bevins, thank you to Vicki Allman, um, the PTA Council of Baltimore County, and many others, uh, Jason Plotkin, it wouldn't have been able to happen without them. Our families are very much thankful, and I do look forward to working with the other communities and businesses in Parkville and working with Lock Raven to see what else we can do to help these students. They need it. We need to break the cycle. If we're able to break the cycle, they can move out and continue and do something great later on in life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Leslie Weber, followed by Eileen Ertel. Good evening. I'm Leslie Weber, and I'm a longtime public school advocate. My two children graduated from BCPS many years ago. I was a PTA president at two schools. I sit on the PTA council board, and I co-founded Advocates for Baltimore County Schools, or ABC Schools. But tonight, I'm speaking as a private citizen. I'd like to talk about the opportunity costs of the STAT initiative. The FY18 proposed operating budget notes that the STAT initiative requires a significant funding commitment and that anticipated annual and ongoing costs will be 57 million per year. This is in addition to the hundreds of millions already spent on the project. The May 2016 County Auditor's Report on BCPS finances was critical of STAT. The report noted that BCPS's budget for the other instructional cost program has been growing in recent years due to the digital conversion STAT program, while funding for the instructional, instructional salaries and wages program has remained relatively flat. Regarding the opportunity costs of funding STAT, the auditor asked why BCPS had chosen to, pri to prioritize this initiative over other competing funding needs. Our school system has nearly half of its students living in poverty, and a large number are homeless. Taxpayer dollars are going toward massive stat expenditures at the expense of expanding feeding and support programs and hiring social workers and pupil personnel workers to meet the needs of these at-risk children. All BCPS students could benefit from more guidance counselors and a lower teacher-to-student ratio. Student safety would improve if better pay were offered to bus drivers to alleviate the severe driver shortage. Stats unwieldy expenditures and maintenance costs siphon away much needed funds for school, schools struggling with lack of drinkable water, crumbling buildings, and environmental impediments to learning, such as lack of air conditioning and workable heat. I am not anti-tech. Technology has its place in education and is clearly a huge part of our world. I'm for the safe and judicious use of technology, as long as objective, measurable learning outcomes show that the tech investment is worth it. The Maryland Educational Technology Plan recommends a three to one student to computer ratio at the elementary school level. This option would merit further review. I ask you to carefully consider stat expenditures, taking into account that student achievement has not increased despite the huge amounts of money spent in this initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eileen Ertel, followed by Amy Freeman.
Good evening, I'm Eileen Hertel. I'm um, a parent of a student in BCPS, and I'm also a school nurse at Pine Grove Elementary. Um, I have been a school nurse for eight and a half years um, with BCPS. I love working for BCPS because it's one of the few systems in the state of Maryland that has a registered nurse in every school. So BCPS values school nurses, and um, that's very apparent. Um, I think BCPS has done a great job of implementing technology into the classrooms, but unfortunately, the school nurses have been left in the Stone Ages. I'm not sure if you're aware, but school nurses in Baltimore County, we do everything by hand. All our documentation is written by hand. Reports are done by uh, manually going through records um, and creating spreadsheets and um, you know handwriting lists uh, so that we can work with parents on health issues. One of the primary jobs at the beginning of the year we have to do is every school nurse has to review every vaccination record of every new student. In a school like Perry Hall High School, that's 500 plus vaccination records. And that just doesn't mean looking to see if it's there, it's looking at every date because sometimes dates are before the child was born so we have to pay attention to those dates we have to make sure they're age appropriate by the requirements and that they're given at the right time some vaccines have to be given after the first birth date so that's all done manually if we had electronic health records the software we would enter the dates of the vaccines and poof you could print out a report of all the kids who are deficient allowing us more time to call the parents coordinate getting the, that documentation or facilitating them to get the needed vaccines that's one thing the other thing is if we had health record electronic health records we could give more safe efficient and effective care because we're bogged down with that vaccination thing with piles of records all over our desks and lists we could be working on getting the documentation from the doctors that asthmatics need plus their medication uh, so that we'd have fewer 911 calls for asthmatics who don't have either the paperwork or the medicine in school or anaphylactics who need EpiPens. Uh, we, could, we could focus our time on those things versus spending months just piling, you know, reviewing records, reviewing records, and doing things that electronic health records can do for us so we can focus on the more important um, issues that create healthier students, and we know that healthier students achieve more. We, I think we can all agree to that. So I'm hoping that you will keep that line item in the budget for software for electronic health records. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker is Amy Freeman, followed by Abby Baton. Good evening. Thank Good evening. you for the opportunity to speak. Um, as chair of the Central Area Education Advisory Council, I have the luxury of receiving a hard copy of the budget, which I'm very grateful for. And I've started to go through, as you can see, um, and would need much more than three minutes to um, to address the concerns that have been raised so far. But I just wanted to highlight and touch on a couple of different things. Um, one, when I look at the school-based staffing um, for regular education on page 122, um, and I tallied all of the teacher um, or the positions that are listed for STAT or digital learning teaching positions, 277.3 is the total. Um, and I have a concern with that because I think that more classroom teachers are needed in the classroom to address the, um, to improve the student teacher ratios. So um, I think that needs um, more attention there. I also um, would request clarification um, for some of the budget line items um, are just labeled as other for the category and um, it's a bit confusing. Um, for example, on page 138 um, in the budget by object classes, the other charges total $255,649,901, which is 89% of the total amount for this whole section. Um, and it's not um, so um, it's confusing because I would like more specifics in terms of what is included in that very large amount. Um, third, I um, was surprised to see the cost of restructuring the assistant superintendents. Um, also on page 138, last year, fiscal year 
17. Um, the total cost for the area superintendents was $1,583,000 and some change. Um, with the restructuring, it's $3,689,848, a difference of two, over $2 million. Um, and it remains to be seen the benefits of that restructuring, but it's worth noting the significant increase in costs. Um, for for student behavior, um, I didn't. There wasn't much of an increase, but as I mentioned before, when we have the pilot program for the. Um, restorative practices, which is only in three schools. I haven't seen a report as to any, um, like the benefits of that program, I would, um, but if there are benefits, I would ask you to consider expanding that pilot beyond the three schools that currently are um, receiving those um, practices. So I'll have a full report I can send in the email. Great, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Abby Baton, followed by Russ Kuhn. Good evening. Good evening. We're very pleased that this budget includes a proposed increase in Baltimore County's maintenance of effort spending. Baltimore County has continued to raise our MOE for the past several years. This recognizes that the MOE was meant to be the floor and not the ceiling on spending. Looking through the budget, it is evident that money has been allocated to bring more special educators and ESOL teachers on board for next year, and that much needed additional pre-kindergarten pre expansion is being proposed through the Judy Centers. There are also provisions for additional related service positions. These are all great steps. What we feel also needs to be addressed in this budget is teacher supports. We need additional teachers above and beyond the teachers required to address the additional student influx. We need to lower our class sizes across the board, but especially in the high schools where they took a big hit several years ago as 200 positions were cut while student numbers remained the same and or increased. We have teachers in our high schools teaching 200 plus students. That does not allow teachers enough time to meet the needs of their individual students, nor to provide the best for their students. It's a numbers game. Take the number of students on a teacher's class load and divide it by the number of minutes in the day. That gives you the amount of time a teacher can spend working with each child. So if you take a teacher with 200 students, that gives the teacher 1.8 minutes a day to work with each student. That doesn't even address, that doesn't even take into account the time between classes and individual class sizes that may influence that time frame. The larger the class, the less time the teacher can spend with each individual. This doesn't even address the amount of time teachers need to correct papers, contact parents, meet individually with students, along with a myriad of other responsibilities expected daily of teachers. TAPCO continually asks for more human resources for our teachers, including behavior interventionists, psychologists, school counselors, pupil personnel workers, nurses, secretaries, and paraprofessionals. Teachers bear the brunt of the workload in the county. They need human resources to help relieve them of the duties that don't require their expertise, but have been placed on their shoulders. They need human resources to address the myriad of needs of an ever-increasing and demanding student body. We need to look seriously at this issue if we are to attract and retain teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baden. Uh, our next speaker is Russ Kuhn. I have that right, or is it Keen? It's Kuhn. Very good. Thank you. Nobody ever gets it right. Hi, my name is Russ Kuhn. Um, I have five children and a few attend various schools within BCPS. Um, unfortunately, I, I couldn't access the entire uh, budget document. I was on the board documents trying to find it, but I did find, and I'm going to talk about um, questions that came up after I was reviewing the FY 2018 operating budget presentation that I believe was given or prepared on the 10th, um, uh, I guess within a week or so ago. Um, some of the things that jumped out at me, and I know we're talking about operating budget, uh, but there was um, a large line item, well, um, that seemed to be increasing. It's, it, was, it was labeled debt service, um, it was a debt service line item, and it was increasing by 12%, um, $5.8 million a year over year, is what I'm guessing that number was. I don't have a lot of detail because it was just a, a PowerPoint presentation, and that was on page 33. Um, 
But that's a large jump. And, and one of the things that I would suggest, and I don't know if the board has the power to do this or if the superintendent does, but it should be studied. We are in a, um, at a point in time where there are historically low rates for borrowing money. Um, and if we need to refinance that borrowing to take advantage of those rates, I suggest that the county and, um, and uh, the board take a closer look at that because that's a significant amount of money and a significant growth in, in one year. I also see that there's um, a large amount of capital project funding uh, decreasing. Uh, $45 million is, is, is in essence gone down, or 13% since last year. I don't know if that was because of uh, construction of a new school that isn't occurring going forward or, or what that is. It just seems to be uh, a rather large uh, change that jumped out. I also wanted to talk a little bit about the presentation. I'm not sure where it was going. There were three areas, uh, managing growth, investing in the future, and a third area that maybe maintaining or something like that. Um, what struck me was investing in the future had the largest portion associated with, in essence, giving raises um, in funding uh, for teachers. Uh, but I see that as a kind of a maintenance cost uh, for the HR that you already have employed. I don't see that as, as investing, uh, because the other line items were associated with technology, STAT being $4.5 million, and uh, tech and maintenance, $5.2 million. And those seem to be pretty high when, in essence, you're adding 70 teachers at a cost of 3.1 million just for regular teaching positions. Uh, I would suggest more spending be, be made on, on bringing in um, more regular teachers, perhaps reducing the stat uh, technology payments and focusing on classroom. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes the, uh, the comments from those who have signed up. Um, the Board of Education will hold a work session on the proposed fiscal year 2018 operating budget on Tuesday, January at 6.30 p.m. in this room. Of course, all written comments received will be compiled to, and distributed to all board members. Uh, the public hearing is now adjourned.